Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second in a series of presentations on ventilation. If I could, uh, I would ask everyone to uh, put their microphones on mute until we get to the question and answer portion of the presentation. It'll make it easier for everybody to hear. So a little legal stuff. Uh, as before, we're recording this presentation for those that are unable to attend today. And for those of you who want to remain in an undisclosed location, you might be want, want to be careful about what you say. And well, we did our best to make the information accurate, but occasionally we screw up. So if we do, it'd be wise to check other sources. When it comes to our lives, pressure is something we constantly feel. But when it is pressure in a building, it's not something that we are generally able to sense. What we do notice, however, is the secondary effects of building pressure, which can be serious and, and truly troublesome. The most common manifestation is when you're trying to enter a building. You go to open the door and you find that it feels like it's locked. But with enough strength, you finally manage to open the door at which point you notice a howling wind going into the building. And finally, if you do manage to get in the door, it slams shut as soon as you let go. This is a negative pressure problem. And by my estimate, probably 60% of the manufacturing buildings in the US have this problem, particularly in the colder months. And in fact, I know of a building in Clark Lake, Michigan that has that problem occasionally. And while annoying and potentially a bit dangerous, doorways are not the only system symptom of negative pressure. Perhaps more serious is backflow of exhaust gases from combustion equipment. This can put bad stuff that should go outside in your building. And on top of everything else, it also makes exhaust fans less effective. So how bad is it? Well, I'm an engineering type of guy, so as soon as somebody starts to discuss an issue, I want to put numbers to it and in order to gauge whether or not it's a big deal. Here's how pressure relates to velocity. This is what happens in a large opening like a doorway or a loading dock. It's somewhat different for small openings like a crack under a door or leakage around a truck door. But if you look at the table at right, it only takes five one hundredths of an inch of pressure to create a 10 mile an hour wind in the opening. Although because this is a square function, it does take 20 one hundredths in order to double that value to 20 miles an hour. As you can see, it just doesn't take much negative pressure to cause an issue. So in the the previous presentation, we did uh, talk a little bit about the necessity of providing a way for the air to come back into a building when you try and exhaust it. Negative building pressure is caused by trying to exhaust more air from the building than it has a, than it has a source for supplier. Mother Nature doesn't like this since she resists you doing this by decreasing the pressure in the building i.e. negative pressure. In the previous presentation, we mentioned the importance of the use of inlet louvers, which do allow replacement air into the building. But we know that oftentimes people design and purchase equipment primarily based on summertime conditions when you often have large doorways open that allow air in freely. The problem is the people who operate the equipment don't want to stop using it as the weather turns a bit uh, colder. And even when it rains, they want to close the doors to keep the, the rain out. So one of the important issues is, even based on the selection information for louvers in the AirMaster catalogs, and assuming that the open area for for the necessary volume is respected, it still means that you're going to create a negative pressure of one eighth of an inch in the building. 
Um, and you don't have to scroll back up to look to see what that is. It's about a 16 mile an hour wind. And that's caused because the selection tables are based on a, a one eighth inch pressure drop through the louver. But there is another solution. And at the end of the day, it's not terribly more expensive, although it does use a bit more energy. So before we go farther, let's step back a moment and take a look at the problem of negative pressure. So you select a fan for a volume flow at one eighth inch pressure at about 11,000 CFM. What is the fan going to do in fact? If you say, well, it's going to do 11,000 and an eighth, well, you're only going to be right a small fraction of the time. What determines the performance of a fan is the system to which the fan is connected. When we say system in this context, we mean all the resistance to flow from the, when the air is outside until it returns outside. And we can attempt to calculate this resistance and then use a, for, a simple formula to um, generate other points. And you can plot those points on, on a curve. So at right is, whoop, sorry, at right is a typical fan curve. The blue line is the performance of the fan. And that is uh, created based on actual testing of the fan. The green line is a resistance curve or a system curve, which is uh, calculated in this case based on a, a given flow of 11,000 CFM and an eighth of an inch. But let's look at what happens when somebody goes over and starts to close the doors on that building. What happens is you're now asking the air to come through a smaller area, which creates more resistance. And so as the doors close, you get increasingly steeper system curves and Eventually, what happens is that uh, you'll get to an equilibrium point where um, the pressure required to pull, pull the air through the, the doorway and push it back out uh, through the fan might be as high as, in this case, three-tenths of an inch or 0.32 inches. The point of operation of a fan is always going to be the intersection of the system curve and the fan curve. So uh, in our example, we started out where just below the green arrow, and now we've gone to where the red arrow is. And you say, okay, what's the big deal about a negative three-tenths of an inch of pressure? Well, there are, in fact, all sorts of negative effects that will uh, occur when the pressure gets to three-eighths of an inch. Um, for instance, uh, you're going to have a problem with the doors. But as we mentioned, or I mentioned uh, briefly before, there's the potential for backflow of gases from uh, things like the unit heater shown at the right. Many of these unit heaters use natural draft uh, to get the combustion products to the outside. And natural draft is the same force that makes a chimney work, but it's not a very large force. And it's quite possible that for a negative three eighths of an inch pressure in the building, it will tend to reverse the flow in the stack such that the combustion products now flow into the building instead of out of the building. And this can be truly annoying because combustion gases are full of irritants. You'll feel it in your nose and your throat. But also, if the heater is maladjusted, it also can contain carbon monoxide, which is a really, truly serious problem. Uh, okay. Uh, for those who know me, they know that I'm very fond of telling stories to illustrate a point. Many years ago on a Tuesday morning, I got a phone call and the person said, the vice president 
and insert the name of a major uh, domestic auto company who is a major company, uh, the vice president wants to see you. And I said, okay, I'll come on Thursday morning. And they said, you don't understand. He wants to see you because we have a major problem. So after a little more discussion, I finally said, okay, I'll get in the car and come right now. When I arrived, I found a brand new engine machining facility that was just getting started. The machining line was about a quarter mile long, and they had a river of coolant next to the line that you could kayak in. At nearly every machine tool along this quarter mile line, they had multiple one inch diameter pipes forcing out coolant at about 100 psi. And the coolant mist was so bad after about eight hours of operation, you couldn't see 20 feet. Well, making it worse was they had 20 of my company's power roof ventilators. And when you looked up at them, you could see that the props were spinning, but the dampers were closed and they weren't exhausting any mist. So I looked around the building and after about 20 minutes, I realized when they designed the system, they had nowhere for the air to enter the building. So I walked over and found a 40 foot high, 40 foot wide loading dock door. And I pushed the button and the door went up and immediately the dampers on the roof ventilators slammed open and started exhausting the oil mist. Of course, he looked at me and said, no, no, we can't have that. The, that cold air is going to disrupt uh, all the tolerances on our machining. I said, well, sir, if you don't want the mist, you got to have some place for air to get into the building. So uh, we looked before at uh, the intersection of the fan curve and the system curve, and that dotted red line at the left is the system curve that I found in this building. And that it gives you an idea of how bad a negative pressure problem can be. So I think by now you have some idea of the problem. One very good solution is to provide, provide both supply and exhaust air at the same time. This is known as balance draft or sometimes just referred to as push-pull. Using identical supply and exhaust fans is a good solution, but I'm going to suggest an even better solution, which is using slightly bigger supply units than exhaust units, particularly where there is other in equipment in the building that's trying to exhaust air. Yes, this can potentially cause a positive pressure instead of a negative pressure in your building, but a slight positive pressure will just make that other equipment work better. Yes, you do have to take a bit of care that you don't let the positive pressure get too great because instead of your door sticking closed, now when you open the latch, the doorway is, or the door is going to have a tendency to come open and try and hit you in the nose. So a little bit of care needs to be exercised with this solution. This is what a... Uh, cross-flow or a push-pull system looks like. Assuming that there is no other equipment exhausting air, then there's no way for the building to go negative because you're uh, potentially ex exhausting exactly the same amount as you're, you're pushing in. But as I said before, we want to consider the case where, in fact, we're going to push a little bit in more in than try to exhaust out. So, where to start? Um, above is a segment of the Airmaster catalog. In this case, it's for 42-inch HA panel fans. Uh, um, also, as a starting place, uh, particularly for a cross-ventilation system, I would suggest looking at the performance of the fan at one-eighth inch of pressure. So, the next thing um, I would suggest 
is I created a ta table here, which is an extract of, of the previous information. So in addition to the model and horsepower and flow at an eighth inch, I've also included the difference in flow from uh, one unit to that immediately above it. So for the first two models, uh, you would have an HA42FA and an HA42HA. And what I'm suggesting is that you use the HA for the, the supply unit and the FA for the exhaust unit. And in this case, it would give you a difference of 1,794 CFM that uh, is a surplus. Um, I've also calculated the velocities, and you'll notice that one of the nice things about this pair is that the velocities are, are fairly low, and for a general rule of thumb, you really don't want any more uh, velocity in panel fans than you find really necessary because uh, velocity can create drafts, it can create turbulence in the space. But in some cases, those aren't a terribly large concern. So it's quite possible to select a pair that is more powerful and moves more air. So in this case, we're looking at the combination of the HA42KA and MA, and it would still have the same difference in flow of about 1800 CFM. But now, as a percentage, it's relatively smaller because the flows have increased. So let's try and make this a bit more real. At right is a building or a part of a building, which is not to scale, but it's 60 by 75 or 75 feet and about 25 feet high. And we're going to provide cross ventilation to the space. So if you remember from the previous presentation, the first step is to denote, determine the number of air changes per hour for the space. For a mixed use building like this one, one has to be a little bit judicious in the selection. Heat treating with its very high heat load is 60 to 120 air changes per hour. But machining, for example, is only 10 to 15. So as a compromise, I'm going to use 40 air changes per hour. So if you do the math, I calculate the building to be about 112,000 cubic feet in volume. The 40 air changes per hour means that I have about a minute and a half to change the air. So by division, I arrive at 73,600 CFM, which is the total supply volume. If I select the HA42MA as the supply units and the HA42KA as the exhaust, then I'll have an excess in total of about 78 or 7,380 CFM. And you'll notice that there's a black dot on the heat treating furnace, and that's the exhaust pipe for uh, that uh, piece of equipment. And that 7,380 CFM could easily be used by the heat treating uh, furnace uh, to exhaust the uh, combustion gases. And that would leave me in a near zero pressure situation for the building. One other thing to note um, is that what I've done is bunched up three of the exhaust fans in proximity to the heat treating furnace. Air is always going to go where it wants to, but that doesn't mean that it isn't worthwhile trying to get it to go where you want. And since I've got a high heat load at the heat treating furnace, what I'm trying to do is to exhaust more air in, in that location. So, Anytime you go into a building, look around for anything that's pipe, uh, piped to the outside and then get a pipe size. After that, we can help you to decide how much extra supply is reasonable. So far, we've been considering panel fans that are the same size but different performance. 
this is often the easiest way or the most economical because of limitations due to the construction of the building. In other words, you've got beams and other structural steel that might be in your way. But there's no reason that this absolutely has to be the case. The units can be different size. There can be a different number of units uh, on the supply side or the exhaust side, or they could be an entirely different type of unit altogether. In this case, I've replaced three of the exhaust units with power roof ventilators instead, which happen to be 36 inch. The reason I did this, roof ventilators are actually better at exhausting hot air from a building. This is because they are mounted at roof elevation rather than lower down on a wall. Hot air rises due to density differences, and it can be difficult to get that hot air to flow down to a wall exhauster. So taking air from the roof line removes the hottest air, which can eliminate the possibility of deg uh, deg degradation to your roof materials over time. So um, as I mentioned, uh, uh, here's a quick trip, a uh, 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 quick tip. Uh, I spoke about extra flow, how, and so the question arises, well, how much extra flow? And as I suggested for, before, pipe spotter. Find the pipes going to the exterior, their approximate size, and you can easily calculate the area. I would suggest using a velocity in that pipe as an approximation of 3,000 feet a minute. So what I've done is set up an example where there are three four inch, four six inch, and one 12 inch uh, pipe. And so now I'm going to guess that I have just about 5,500 CFM that's being exhausted. So that's a good way to gauge uh, the amount of excess air that you're going to want to have. One other uh, little suggestion. Negative pressure, positive pressure are important values. And so if it's important, you probably ought to measure it. And for something, you know, slightly less than $100, you can purchase uh, a gauge as, as shown. This one goes from negative one inch to positive one inch, which is probably what you would expect, except in really severe cases, uh, that the building uh, would actually have. And as I suggested before, you want to try to have a very slight uh, positive pressure on your building. Only takes about 20 minutes to install, and it's a good way for customers to uh, actually keep track of, of what their system is doing. So, I've come to the end, uh, and I know that uh, I have a tendency to uh, talk at about the same speed as a machine gun, uh, but I will be happy to answer questions. Alternately, I would suggest uh, if questions uh, come up after, as they usually do, contact Forrest, um, the, he, our uh, national ventilation sales manager, and his email is there, or you can uh, reach him through the uh, main number. Uh, thanks for your attention, and uh, go ahead. If you have questions, unmute your mic and ask away. Okay. Well, I've stunned you all into silence. Hey, Kevin, this is Gary Ozias. One question. Um, is this available that you used this presentation available to us? Yes. Uh, the reason it's being recorded uh, is uh, within a day or two, we have been putting them up on our website, and you can just go to the website, and uh, it'll be there for your use at any time. Great. Thank you very much. You're most welcome.
Okay. Well, before I let you go, I do have one other uh, issue that uh, I want to bring to your attention. Um, I spend a fair amount of my time studying the available literature on the pandemic and how air movement and con air conditioning systems might affect transmission. And in fact, I'm now part of an AMCA, which is uh, the Air Moving and Control Association, which is the trade group for the uh, fan manufacturers task force that's developing recommendations for the CDC, in particular for manufacturing environments. Given the recent increase in infections, I think, uh, unfortunately, you're going to have to agree that uh, this pandemic is not going to go away any time in the near future. And there is considerable mounting evidence and agreement from scientists that the infection can be transmitted by aerosols, which are less than five microns in diameter. And these aerosols remain airborne for extended periods of time. The issue is the typical plastic shields often used in manufacturing will do absolutely Absolutely nothing to prevent against this type of transmission. That is to say that the air isn't going to respect that uh, plastic shield, and it's just going to flow wherever it wants. Um, and unhappily, most masks are not even uh, a particularly good protection, because in order to protect against aerosols, the masks have to be extremely tight to the face and eliminate any gaps around uh, the sides or, or the nose. So earlier this summer, we made a presentation of the effective use of air moving equipment against viral transmission. Um, and uh, as mentioned before, that presentation is on the AirMaster website. One of the primary recommendations was to use air moving equipment to provide dilution air. And dilution air is a very effective method of prevention, even for aerosols. The issue is it won't be much longer before cold weather returns. And unfortunately, manufacturing plant heating systems are generally not designed to be able to heat the large volume of air that is necessary to provide effective dilution air control but there's still going to remain a necessity to control the aerosols in the manufacturing environment. And in fact, um, we would contend it's not only manufacturing environments, but other environments as well. You know, think of uh, uh, large shopping malls or even schools. And there is a solution, and AirMaster is offering it, it's our newly released MERV-13 filter fan. MERV-13 filters are what, in fact, are being recommended by ASHRAE. No, they are not 100% efficient in terms of collection, but they are effective against even five micron particles. And as the air cycles through, what this is going to do is reduce the amount of virus that's in the air and consequently reduce the chances of transmission. The only reason, or one of the reasons, that uh, I'm bringing it to your attention is it's going to take time to get this equipment ordered, produced, delivered to distributors, and out to the end user. So we'd like you to start thinking about this product now in order to meet demand when the doors start to uh, be closed. So there's my secondary pitch for the day. And once again, I will thank you all for attending. And uh, I'll stick around to answer any questions that you might have. All right, everyone. I will wish you a